How you guys doing? Now, I understand this is Talladega week, uh, but I'm not really doing a Talladega preview video. I already have my playlist, and I'm just going to put in the bottom of the uh, of the comments here and stuff. We're looking towards Dover once we get back next week. I, I mean, look, like, I mean, I'm going to be live this week talking Talladega, and I think I'm going to do more of, like, a live, like, let's try and truly project ownership and see where builds are going to go and everything like that, but for the most part, it's Talladega. Like, come on, guys. Um, you know how I'm playing. You know how you should be playing. I don't, we don't need to worry too much about that. What I want to talk about a lot, and mainly because we have an off week, is going over this Texas race in, in kind of a more DFS-centric um, focused way. Okay, and now first and foremost, I do this every week for all three races, for everything that goes on. I just don't record it because I don't believe people would truly sit here and watch me go over that. Um, and it, it, I just work faster around not having to talk through it. All this stuff is always factored into my projections the next week, and you know, or it's like uh, not like factored in, but like I'm aware of all this stuff entering. The week when I talk about pit data, when I talk about how these guys are running the race, when I talk about where they're at, this is all the stuff I do post race and looking at it from a DFS perspective and stuff like that. So maybe you guys might like that, maybe you won't, but either way, uh, like it's it's Talladega week, might as well make some content that isn't just step from the back and stuff. So let's uh, it's gonna go through. So when we look at Texas, okay, and we look at how this race unfolded, I am personally looking at now, this is a very difficult race to if you're just looking at the numbers, like if you're you know, when, when we talk about issues with driver rating and average running position and what is happening in this race, this is a very difficult race to solely look at one data point, which is why I think this is a great video or a great example or a race for me to do this type of video on because it's much more than, well, where are these guys running? You know, all these guys who came up late in the race, their average running position was outside the top 15, outside the top 10. We, like, we all understand that. And we all see that. Like, when we look at, you know, um, Phil posting this on the Twitter uh, about where these fellas were, you know, and we look at the, the eight of the top 12 running positions from yesterday's race, and we look at where these guys were at and stuck in the race, you know, you might see this of like, oh, it's, a, it's a, I don't even know who this guy is. No offense. Uh, he, hey, you follow me. <laughs> like, <clears throat> uh, like, I mean, this is totally true, but I think there's much more than just like, man, Texas is, is random. Like whenever I'm looking at, you know, my running total of, of, uh, not my running total, but my, uh, recent form and everything like that. Um, this is all the things that I want to focus on. So I even have the, uh, you know, I even pulled up the, uh, the CSV for you guys to talk about, or for you guys to look at, which we'll look at some more intel but when we look at the amount of yellows that came out we understand that you know jimmy johnson's just talentless we go green from the start of the race to johnson spinning out to the end of stage one so outside of johnson spinning out stage one pretty good data pretty good data to work with uh not really jumbled up stuff uh and i'll talk about kyle bush specifically in the sense of stage one but for the most part this race didn't get stupid here okay yes we get the instant in turn four with bell um the first incident with Nemechek and, uh, you know, Bowman having nowhere to go and plowing into, uh, to, I think it was, I think it was Jones out of four. It, either way, these guys wreck out of four and then we go eight laps and then we spin again. Then we go three laps and then we spin and do stupid shit. And then this happens and then we spin out and right, right, right. So we can argue that right here, at least in terms of where people are running at, uh, especially because we get the opening run of where people should be. You know, great example of where everybody is, you know, post qualifying and where they're at. We have a caution where everybody can make adjustments. We go back green for 26 laps. And so we're able to see where people are based on those adjustments, if they're able to do anything. And then we get chaos and, you know, wreck, 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 and then short run, short run. And then we get another, we get two long runs. You know, we get this long run here. And then we get this 20 lap run to end the race. Then past that from lap 255 to 276, it's just checkers or wreckers it's just you know everybody's spinning out and so for me you know after i've already pulled everything and looked at everything what i'm doing for this specific video is here i as i am looking at this race from this point before okay and the reason being is the fact that we had yes we had people who got trapped lap down early in the race due to you know where yellow came out during your flag pit stops we had several drivers get those laps back during these situations here we had a lot of chaos on the restarts we had a lot of people going up through the field we had a lot of people passing people late in the race here 
Okay, and so yet again, when we're getting back to where this average running position was, like we have, you know, Dylan, Bush, Josevar, Logano, Priest, all these guys move up late in the race and finish in the top 12, despite the fact they all had a average running position of 15 or worse. Yet again, thank you, Phil, for going and posting that. Um, and so what I want to do is look at, in terms of me, like, uh, actually, I need to bring the, uh, the recent form over. Let me do that real fast. Hold on. So I'm just pulling, I'm just getting, I'm just moving this recent form over to the Dover uh, sheet. And I need to make this one here since I'm just doing this now. Um, and so we're not removing anything. And I haven't made, oh, fuck, I haven't made the Texas one yet, uh, which I don't know if I mean they're going to, if I'm even going to use it in this sense. But, and this is, you know, we're keeping, just for this video, we're keeping the Las Vegas. So we can kind of see where everybody was at. And so we have Texas, that was the next race, and that is practically where I'm at, going to be basing off of where people were running and where they were at uh, up until lap 253. And, as I said, with all these yellows and stuff, there's a lot of data points, and I would not argue, at least I'm on the stance of, there's a lot of data points that's pretty unusable in this race. Like, average running position is unusable, driver rating is unusable because of all, all, the, all the factors that I've already explained of why I don't like using, you know, necessarily driver rating. And this is very much going to be where at least they were during stage one, where everybody and how they were running between lap 185 to 229 and from 235 to 254, depending on where they were at in traffic here. Everything else is just, did you survive? Did you not get fucked over by a yellow, et cetera, et cetera, yada, 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 and stuff like that. And so when we're looking at where, let me call Bobby really fast. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, as we're looking at like how chaotic this race ends up playing out, and we look at where the ownership ended up coming in for this race. Now, granted, this is you know post the fact so we can see where everybody was in terms of fantasy points. Um, I was very much. I mean, hell, even when we look at Texas here, I'll even show you where I was at. So, like clearly, you know, everybody was with Larson being there and stuff, and I was much higher on Byron per usual. Um, just the fact that. You know, if if Larson doesn't perform or a situation like that, like it's most likely going to be Byron who's able to step it up or at least maintain a running position in the top four. And um, it very much went to like I didn't like Logano or I didn't like Elliott or Logano a ton. Like clearly they they weren't projected for uh, you know destroying the field and getting laps led. I mean like, Chase literally fell into it because you know they they stayed long to try and gain track position and fell in the lead. Same thing with Logano. But I ended up having quite a lot of each of these drivers just based on these projections that I made for them with the builds that were being shown my way. Like when I go ahead and look at the lineups that I ran, I only had one lineup that was dead in this race because it had both Bowman and, and Nemechek. And there's nothing better in the world than seeing an already dead line have another guy be involved in the race so you don't have to sweat like, oh my God, we made it through. But a lot of the projections or a lot of the lineups that were being presented to me um, based on my projections, had very much a lot of Elliott and Logano uh, in both of them, a even with paying up for, you know, Larson and Byron and Reddick and some of these as well. Like, it was very much, my projections were loving Elliott and Logano when I started running them, and I kind of mentioned that in the live show, especially when it came to the fact that people wanted to play Chastain. This isn't because he got spun on the, on the last lap, but I was just saying, like, if you're in that range, I would much rather prioritize Elliot. Um, and yeah, again, this is like truly like nobody projected Elliot or Lagana to even lead laps or be like dominant in this race. Like if anybody's saying that, they're insane. But that's typically how I've ended up falling on people just based on what projections are, are saying and showing and stuff. Same thing with like Priest came through. And as you could see, I had no Kyle Bush. No Kyle Bush. And I said that in a live show. I mentioned it a lot that I thought if you didn't play Kyle Bush, you stood a really good chance of, of being able to cash in this in the uh um in the slate anyway the reason i'm bringing that up is to explain at least you know 2020 vision are coming through like how situations happen and specifically how these lines end up performing despite the fact so many people came through the race late and finished up front so when we're looking at texas or we're looking at this well first off we'll talk like ownership here and as i said like ideally and, and correct me if i'm wrong here and there's two things that i've seen you know and a lot of the run pure guys have brought this up stats and Rubio and, and even myself have been saying this before, especially in the other series and stuff. I'm much more aggressive in terms of if I think somebody's going to be 
optimal or have a good chance, I'm going to be overweight. And I just kind of play the same line, just do a lot of 1v1s and 2v2s. And we're seeing that happen a lot more in the two lower series. And we're starting to see, I mean, not even starting to see, but like this 61% ownership is pretty insane. Um, like, at least for me, and correct me if I'm wrong here, at least just thinking out loud or talking out loud, I've always seen ownership as what the percentage that that driver should be optimal at. Like, that ownership relative to where they should perform should be very similar. Like, one shouldn't be bigger than the other. And so, like, with Larson, with any given driver starting on the, on the front row, this isn't just Larson. This is just on any track. Like, maybe not even... I'm speaking for more 1.5s. That driver has a chance to be an optimal, I would say, anywhere from 35 to 45% of the time. That's not saying they even wreck out or don't perform and stuff. I'm saying, like, that... They fight to be optimal around 40% of the time. And so for me, I'm always shocked when I see, certainly in like a Cup Series race, someone own this much. Okay, and then secondly, with the place differential play of, of, of Kyle Busch and stuff, we'll talk about this as we go through the, the lap-by-lap -lap stuff. And, oh, I didn't even, I'm not even going to bother bringing, I was going to bring up the speeds, but we're already doing this kind of uh, on a whim anyway, or not a whim, but like I'm kind of throwing this thing together. When we look at Kyle Busch's speed, not only... Were he didn't have bad speed, but the fact that you couldn't pass at Texas was really detrimental to what Bush was doing all day. And if you look at his speed relative to where he was with the leader, especially once we got through the race and actually got deep, like during this run here, and certainly during um, some of these shorter runs here, like Kyle Bush, yes, he was a lap down, yes, he was trap lap down, so he's shown that like ran in the back of the field, but in terms of speed, he's running practically identical speeds with the leaders. And when we look at the entire field in, together, we're seeing that you, you just literally couldn't pass. The reason why I personally focus on the people who are able to consistently be in the top five is because those are the guys that can usually either not even pass cars specifically. Like we, we can clearly see that like there's very little passing and a lot of the field is running the same speed and you just can't get a run here at Texas and stuff. And it's, it's going to be the same thing at Dover. We just don't get the wrecks and stuff. But when we're looking at guys who are actually being able to carry speed up top, you know, you're able to maintain a running position in the top five or four or six or whatever, regardless of who's in front of you, who's behind you, regardless of situations. Like when you look at Byron here, yet again, I'm just bringing up Byron because like for me, I probably should have played less Byron here. Byron underperformed in my opinion, despite the fact that when we look at William Byron and where he ran, like yet again, this is stopping at 253. But when you look at where Byron was all day, the guy was, you know, practically in fourth all day. Once he was able to actually get through, I mean, I'm, I haven't highlighted the uh, um, the cautions or anything because that, that doesn't necessarily matter. But he starts seventh, passes one guy, we get a yellow, he pits, comes back a tenth, able to drive to ninth. We get another yellow, I believe, or we're getting green flag pit stops. No, this is the, uh, let me bring this over here so I can keep up with what lap we were on and what is going on here. So, like when we're looking at Byron, lap 51. So, uh, oh yeah, actually these guys had a green flag pit stop. So, green flag pit stops happen. He pits um, because he's so fast and he's up front. He doesn't have to worry about being trapped lap down. And so he goes back up. We're still green, still green. We get a yellow on lap 51. So he's driven up from 12th to 9th, able to pass the field. He cycles up, starts 4th. Falls back to six, just basically holds this situation here. Excuse me. So, like, when I'm looking at this race here, I'm like, fuck, you know, Byron is very much underperforming um, based on the, based on this type of stuff, with, with which what we have seen from, from Byron. Very much underperforming based on where he is here. This is the type of bill, or this is the type of expectation I would have for Byron, where he basically did the same thing he did at Texas last year. And this is one of the, the slower tracks for him. But with that said, we're seeing that we get another yellow. And we see that regardless of what's happening in this race, the guy is just maintaining the, the basically still maintaining the top 10, but he's basically just sitting in, in sixth to seventh all day. If he gets up front, it's because, you know, people up front are wrecking out or running into issues, but he's basically in seventh all day. And as we start having more and more guys run into issues, as we start having more and more guys happen, you know, he falls into fourth again to where he's like right there, you know, or you can look at it in the sense of who's up there that shouldn't be up there based on where they've been in terms of recent form and stuff. And so when you look at Elliott, you know, 
And yet again, for me, like I just ended up on Elliot based on what I predicted for. There was no rhyme or reason for me to be on as much Elliot as possible other than just what my projections were showing me and the builds were showing me. Um, very much like if I like Byron, I like Elliot, I should at least, or I like Byron, I like Larson, I should project um, Elliot for some type of point. This is the wrong one. It's like some type of projection that would actually show that he's there. And I think that ended up being projected for like an 11th place, which is right on the fringe. If he did any better, he would practically be locked in. Those are typically plays where I see that. And I'm like, okay, I probably need to start having quite a lot of, uh, of Elliot there. And so, you know, when you look at Byron and like, okay, he's in fourth, what's keeping Byron out of being a top three guy? What's, what's happening with the situation here? Who's in front of him? Well, he has Chase Elliott who shouldn't be up there. I'm not saying like he's bad. I'm just saying based on what's going on, like Elliott is an anomaly of being in the top three. So Byron's third, and this is just on lap 210, which is, um, under green flag conditions, so right before we get to more green flag pit stops. So, like, who's up here that's keeping Byron out of, like, leading the race or situation here? Reddick, clearly fast, expected to run the top five. Hamlin, expected to run the top five. Elliott, an anomaly. Byron right there. And then we have other guys who, like, stayed out, gained track position. Who else are, like, maintaining a running position right now? Like Zane Smith. We have Stenhouse. We have Gregson, Chastain, Jones, Logano yet again. Um... Actually, sorry, that is just based on this this lap. This is what I'm sorting by right now. Um, so the people in that, let's move it back a little bit. So at this point, Zane Smith, Gibbs, Stenhouse, Jones, uh, Priest, Nemechek, Gillen, LaJoy, like, and Larson's falling out. And so when you look at where Byron was just, you know, during these green flag runs and, you know, yet again, looking through how the race was playing out, we have a lot of yellows and a lot of things where people are staying out, gaining track position and et cetera, et cetera. That's why I like, I'm not trying to make an excuse for Byron. I'm just explaining it or things that I'm looking at of what I need to do to justify either where I'm going to place him, where he was in this race. Like, was he truly, you know, a sixth place car? Who was he racing around? What was going on with Byron during this race, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, who was up front, who wasn't up front, was this because, like, if Larson was up here and Elliott wasn't here, would he still be fourth? These are just things that I usually go over and look through and, and break down on my own accord. Because, like, as you can see, I'm just kind of rambling or talking out loud. And it makes, at least I think it makes uh, bad content. I don't know. Some people might argue with me on that. Um, but when we're looking at how this race is going, now that we've kind of talked about or at least for my own curiosity of where, where Byron was, where he'll break down. Let's go ahead and look at Kyle Busch's drive here. So let's get to Kyle Busch, and let's go to the end of this kind of... Yet again, I'm not going to the end of the race. I'm going to lap 253. So let's sort by right here. So at this point... Okay, so now that we got that sorted... Okay, so let's take a gander through Kyle Busch's race and I mentioned this I actually mentioned this to Astukas and a couple other guys in, in, in Discord that I was really concerned entering this race that not only would Kyle Bush not be able to get up through the field, he would get stuck he could possibly get stuck a lap down right in the back of the field. And so when I look at where I had Kyle Bush, I had him projected for, you know, right around like a seventeenth and this is actually incorrect, uh, because this doesn't take an account of the two points that I give or the two points that are uh, given um, separating um, like yet again I'm I'm, I'm just kind of rambling here so like he started 35th this is DraftKings points so he's I'm giving him 18 DraftKings points because it's technically him breaking one wall here one wall here and so he's basically gaining 16 positions but the way that I just want to free ball it and see it that's like 16th so realistically that was more of a like a 19th place finish that i was projecting for and the reason being is i was very much concerned about kyle bush being trapped a lap down not having a fast car not not because he's not having a fast car but because of how difficult it is to pass here at texas that you just get stuck running like 24th and stuff you know and the thing that i wanted to focus on 
when I was watching the races, how fast was Kyle Busch able to get by people? Like when we're looking at where he's starting by and the people he's starting around, you know, you know, uh, oh boy, I said it the wrong way. Sorry. When we're looking at the people he's starting around, and we do have guys go to the rear and stuff. We have like Ty Dillon, Johnson, Hemrick, Austin Hill, Kaz Grala. Like these are the people he's racing around and where Kyle Busch has been running and where he's at and what this car can do. We can very easily see that Kyle Busch has a very much, you know, certainly a top 20 car. If things go correct and things go right, he's going to have, you know, a top five car, which despite the fact that they're running three teams this week, despite the fact that he's, or with the fact that they're running three teams this week, with the fact that he was going to a backup, like this was very unlikely, but his baseline was very much a top 20, right? Or at least right on the fringe of top 20, which is actually right. That is 19th. So like the top 20 would be right here. And so on good days of where they haven't destroyed cars, he has been in this situation before and few positions higher than that are not going to drastically change his outlook in terms of DFS, okay? And the fact that we were seeing a lot of people basically lock in Kyle Busch as a core play, a lot of different sites were doing that. I was um, I was on the side of, there's a lot of situations to where, I got to stop talking, there's a lot of situations to where Kyle Busch very much underperforms, and he kills a lot of lineups, and he hurts a lot of lineups and stuff. And yet again, we're just talking through or at least I'm talking through stuff, and I'm trying to analyze what race are going on. We haven't even talked about the actual finishing of this race yet. And when I looked at this projection of, of 61, or the, the the kind of going back, some of the do some of the people that I do like in this space, like I I really do listen to what Rubio and and Stas say in their shows on Run Pure, and Rubio dropped a Think about Kyle Busch that he very realistically could see him scoring 60 points today. And I was very hesitant on that as a player trying to analyze what the field is going to do because I had such a drastically different outlook on what his performance would end up being. As I said, like this is where I had Kyle Busch at, like right at 42 points. And I understand that was clearly lower than the um, than the field, but the reason being is I just figured that there was a real chance he'd get stuck in traffic and wouldn't be able to really do anything and so when we look at kyle bush we'll just keep it here so the race starts and he is not you know i mean we're 10 11 12 13 laps here in texas we can't really expect him to do anything more than this but then he starts getting passed by people and starts really like he's not showing speed in this car you know and then they pit and they get trapped lap down can't do anything about that um when this caution comes out at lap 56 so at this point you know kyle bush they well actually they're not even available to stay out or to do anything different because we've gone green from lap one to lap 50 him starting the back of the field doesn't give him the opportunity to, to stay on a red long because you got to think about where the leader is in comparison to where kyle bush is at in the situation very much well let's go ahead and just take a look so we're at lap 34 so if we just want to that's where the caution comes out. We're at 39. Uh, let's just kind of see really fast. We're talking about these guys fucking goofing around. So we're seeing that. I'm going to mute this. Pause it. And I just want to see where Kyle Busch is at relative to the leader. So Kyle Busch is 28 seconds behind the leader at this point. Practically, he's not a lap down, but he's, I mean, he's, he's like truly like based practically a lap behind the leader. So even if, he's, if he runs long, he's not able to gain position. So he just pits, eats it. You know, runs last because just just where he's at in terms of this. The caution comes out on lap 51. So at this point, he's a lap down. You know, he's not the lucky dog situation here. And so at this point, this data isn't necessarily relative to what he's able to do here because once he goes green, he's able to pass through the field. Like he's able, he's certainly not the 33rd worst guy. And this is not a situation of where I told you not to play Kyle Busch. That's not what I'm saying here. This is just unlucky. This is how racing is. But a real thing you have to consider of going to a backup car, RCR running a situation to where they're running three cars, which isn't my negative point there, but there's a lot against Kyle Busch coming from the back in this race. And what I wanted to look at was how well he was able to move up through the field. And so yet again, as I'm, as I looked at this race, I project him for right around 19th, 18th. Okay. I've explained why, but still going from like 18th, 19th to 13th, 
or falling back to 24th and stuff like that's not a really big difference in terms of what that lineup is doing at his price tag and what the builds are looking at especially relative to what the potential optimal lineup could be when you're looking at a race and stuff you know at this point we're halfway we're halfway through the race we are lap 128 um which we we're having a lot of yellows at this point and i want to look at his kind of run from lap 150 here and so at this point you know he's back in the lead lap he's running 20th running in 18th and stuff and he's just not able to pass people like he is not able to get around people at all we end up having green flag or we go green here at lap 150 so we're coming out of yellow 18th 19th 20th 18th 19th 20th under green flag this is kyle bush has passed he's gone through the field that he needed to pass like that he's expected to pass he's running right, right where he's at and he's not showing you know the true ability to pass people i'm not saying he doesn't have speed it's this it's in this area to where when you're looking at kyle's speeds compared to the leader's speeds which is uh Ron, well that's where chastain but like bubba's up there uh we have maybe that's why I just happen to be looking at this stuff because I was looking at his speed on the NASCAR live stream or the NASCAR live feed comparison to the leader. So you could argue that like if he's running the identical speed to like Chastain, some of these guys in this situation here or not that fall off, or not that far off. Is that because we have necessarily like worse cars up front? Uh, is that because some of the faster cars like Hamlin and Larson and these, you know, even Chase Elliott in this situation are stuck in the back of the field or stuck behind people, not in the back of the field. But you know what I mean? Um, and so anyway, when you get to Kyle Busch here, like this guy is not having a very good race at all and is underperforming like a fucking motherfucker. Like that is wicked wild. So at this point, you know, the second long green run that we have from 185 to 229 should be an indicator of where he was in terms of speed. Because this is once we get through a lot of pit stalls once he gets through a lot of the, the the gunk and the muck and you know like all that stuff he's been able to make adjustments they've gone through the field they have been in traffic they have been able to make adjustments what is what is he able to do during this last run from 185 to 229 a 45 lap run that's green that'll be the last true green flag run in this race so we end up starting at let me just make sure he's not a lap down at this point uh, let's see, so that's stage two, 185, so that won't be very, f so we're at 76, 78, 84, let's just make sure, thank you for showing the manufacturer, so Kyle Busch is not a lap down at this point, okay, here's in 24th, five seconds off, or, you know, I mean, it's like 188, 187, but he's not a lap down, like, he's racing with people that are you know we have lars we have larson logano wallace room we're not expecting him to pass those guys but he should be able to once these guys get around people he should be able to also chew them down or pass them like that's what we would expect from kyle bush in the situation here and when we look at what he's able to do he just he's just stuck in these positions now he's passing people like the people he's passing we'll look at like 201 here uh he'll be right here so who is he racing by so we've got bubba uh larson has been passed at this point um where's logano has logano passed people <clears throat> actually a lap in my swing by this one um so bell's back here where did logano go logano's i'm doing it the wrong way sorry See, this is why I don't do this live, because this would just piss people off if they had to deal with my incompetence of knowing how to click things correctly. But, like, you know, he's got Bubba Wallace behind him, so he's got around him. He's got Haley in front of him. He's going to pass Larson, Bell. But, like, when you look at Logano and his ability to pass people, like, from where he was at, like, this is, like, actual speed and traffic going from start of this run from, like, 22nd back up to, like, 16th. Like, that's... That's impressive from Logano. Like, that's what you want to see from people who actually have the ability to actually get around people. It's not all just based on relative speed. It's about, you know, not being hindered by the wake of the air from the cars in front of you on these long runs and stuff like that. And so, you know, when you're looking at Kyle Busch here, you know, like, this is very much an underperformance from him. You know, he gets up to 18th, 17th, which is, like, right where he should be at. 
and stuff like based on you know based on all this stuff like that's where Kyle Bush is is at that's not shocking I don't I don't think that's shocking at all um of where he's at and so this is not speaking DFS wise yet. We've just been looking at where he was running at in his story and kind of where we're at. And so this green flag ends at 229. Um, it's 208. People start pitting. So he stays out. He runs long and he catches the yellow. You know, no fault, nothing bad, not trash talking. I mean, you had to do that to gain positions here. In this race, like you had to run long, especially with the like the guaranteed yellows you were gonna have, like that was you just had to run long. But that ends up, you know, keeping him in this race. And even like once, I mean, I know we we keep getting yellows and stuff. He was still slow, like he was still getting passed back uh, in this race. And we just have yellows and he gains positions and stuff like that. But when you look at this race, like this is what saved Kyle Busch was um, was running long at this situation because they know they didn't have the car to actually get by people yellow comes out he saves it but in terms of where of, of how i project people based on their speed this is very much a situation where kyle bush had like a 20 second best car um and just struggled in traffic and very much situation where this this percentage and combine that with like larson also ran an issue the two biggest chalk plays were underperforming and this is based on you know out of his own control he gets you know i mean you can argue i'm not i mean we can argue semantics all day but um like that that was truly concerning with uh with kyle bush and stuff that he was such a locked in play to where like you look at his pricing and those builds like i don't understand why he was owned so much i know he was starting from 35th but all these factors were very much in play to where you did have chase elliott and um logano and yeah, sure, he doesn't score any one, but, you know, Chase Elliott had a much higher chance of just running 11th and 10th all day compared to, you know, Kyle Busch. Same thing with Logano. Like, I was very shocked to see all the place differential ownership went to Kyle Busch and didn't go to Elliott or Jones, okay? Like, that's, like, at least being aware of that or what the, the DFS field is doing. Like, that that's huge. Yet again, it goes back to if, if people are going to be so locked on, truly, like, when we looked at the practice date and stuff i mean we argued this on the show but like byron and and larson should not have this big of a gap between them in terms of ownership we've seen it the last several years of the fast cars or there's several fast cars and then just ownership centered centralizes around one individual driver like that is not good at all especially when you look at larson compared to um reddick like 61 to 36 are you you got to be kidding me man these guys were like identical plays as well there's there's no true separation between them and and where they're at with Larson being here and Reddick being here like when Reddick has good speed and practice and shows that and qualify and they are identical plays that is insane that like there was such a gap between Larson and Reddick that's just crazy. And so, like, th this ownership was whack. I don't, I'm not entirely sure what is going on here because there are true gaps in the approaching of how these contests are playing out and stuff. And um, this isn't even, a, we haven't even talked about how the contest ended. Okay. With all the L's we had and everything going through, like, you know, that's why it, it's very important to follow, in my opinion, follow live scoring. Not because of, oh my god, I'm winning money, oh my god, I'm here. But, like, when we're looking at how lineups are competing directly with each other. As I said, I had no Kyle, I had no Kyle Busch. What is this contest pay? Like, 5,800 people? I finished 280. Uh, 405, 1,500, 2,000. You know, I think I only, yeah, I just had the one lineup with, with Bowman and, and Nemechek, not cash. And you can see, you know the builds that I was running with compared to what ends up being optimal and stuff and Kyle Busch coming through, you know, true, I mean, true contest change there. But realistically, like you could, you very easily were able to cash and compete like both those. I think the top, I know I have to look back. 
I don't remember exactly which one, but I had two in the top 100 all day. Um, and that's not a, oh, don't, oh, shucks, man. You know, I got screwed at the end of the race. Like, that's very much like how the race is going to end the way it ends. Like, whatever. But being aware of what builds are very easily going to, com- like, compete that are different, that are, like, just there. I, I don't know. Like, I, that's that's the point of this or the point of, like, NASCAR DFS that I love to dive into of the different builds that you can make that are very viable, that are off the chalk that are drastically different and that were very much like destroying the field like that that's insane and yet again we're going off of two races back to back where larson has been the most popular play ran into issues last last week at martinsville he just ended up being outscored by people you know and then which is rare and then this is another situation where yeah he scores 40 points he was technically involved in in wrecks didn't wreck out only scored 40 points like being aware of what's going on and, and how the field is playing these guys like that's, I, I don't know, man. It's uh, like, that's, that's what I like to look at and, and talk about and focus on and stuff. Um, and I feel bad for these guys. Cause these guys swapped the, uh, the top um, thing once uh, stat corrections came through and everything. Um, but man, when you're looking at where, one, 150, 150, 150. MME player, 66, that's a big thing. MME, I mean, that's big. 125, one, that's practically 150, 150, 150. Expensive, basically 150. You know, we get some guys coming in through, but 150, 150. Like, Big T, like, say what you will, Big T knows what he's doing. He's been playing very, very well um, recently. And when you look at where, like, I don't think he broke even here. Well, no, he probably did. What is it? 15. What would that be? Oops. So he needs 22.50 to break even. I'd have to look at the payout distribution. But, like, he's having a lot of guys be competing in there. Like when we're, when you're talking about looking at how guys are building lineups, which is which is really nuts, because you you do see a lot of 150 guys typically, and this is I'm just using him as an example here, because this is what this is what you should do anyway, like post race, post contest, or whatever sport you focus in. Go ahead and look at where everybody's scoring and how guys who know what they're doing actually you know build lineups and stuff. But we've seen, or at least I've noticed that he's very he's usually overweight on the chalk plays. Like this is interesting as well. This is one that did not have. Kyle in there. And so I'm assuming that Big T got back his entry fee just based on the amount that he had in the top 400. Uh, and the fact that he tied for ninth, I'm going to assume that he brought, he, he, he was able to get that 2200 back. Um, but man, and then I'm going to assume there's a lot of deadlines as well. Uh, we're looking at 58. We are probably not. Let's see. 58 was the payoff, I think. So he had half of his lines cash. That's, I mean, that's a good day for Big T, man. That's a really, really decent day uh, with how crazy this race got. Anybody else up here that I recognize or want to focus on? I don't think Whistles is playing anymore. Mm, let's see. How'd he do? Oops. Interesting. Anyway, I don't know how helpful this uh, this race was for you. Uh, and I mean, I, I know I focused on primarily like Byron and Kyle Busch. We can kind of look through like Reddick as well. So let's go ahead and just, so we'll just sort it by the starting grid here and kind of look at where everybody played out at. So like Kyle Busch, uh, Kyle Busch, Kyle Larson, we know where he was at. We know what happened to his day, you know, doing well, then just gets, uh, I forgot exactly what happened to Kyle right now. On Thursday, I just completely went blank. Uh, Gibbs underperformed. I have no fucking clue what the hell people are doing here. I don't know why he was owned at all. I, this is shocking. This is in, this is what I mean of why, and why I do this and why I keep up with how the field is playing these guys. Like Ty Gibbs have have has shown, not he's not shown the ability to win on a one point five. It'll be on a short track or a road course. This is what Gibbs has been doing in this car, you know. And we, and we look at where Ty like that. That's insane, brother. 
30% on Gibbs starting second at, what, 82 or something? That is insane. That is crazy. I don't know what was forcing people to do that. I just don't I don't get that at all. He loses the lead. or he, I mean, he gets the lead when they, they pit. You know, has a bad pit stop and stuff. But just, you know, even once things cycle out, he's just right back to, you know, from 6th to 11th, which is what we're expecting. Like, that's... That's a play that is dead on arrival. Like, you need him to not only compete with Kyle Busch of, like, oh, what happens if he gets lead? But he needs to have, like, a dominant day. That That's nuts. When we look at Reddick, who had a really, really long day, really, really frustrating, very much just got stuck in fourth, you know, once everything kind of circled out, and then only got the lead coming out of yellows and coming out of uh, restarts, which, is, which isn't a, a bad thing, but understanding what got him the lead. Like, he Reddick had, like, the third best car fourth best car could not really ever take the lead on his on his own it had to be done on pit lane and then he got fucked on the last he got fucked in the green flag pit stops again by his team that's incredible briscoe like i i don't when i see like briscoe here i'm like why would anybody even play briscoe if he falls back to like 13th he's dead dead on arrival and he got stuck running eight like oh overperformed or overperformed relative to what i expect them to do but like but was briscoe optimal Where'd Briscoe run? How did, what did Briscoe score? Briscoe scores 38. Uh, is he, where is he at? The 90th. 335. So practically, what was his price at? 77. I had him for finishing like 16th, which is probably probably a step back. But man, that's a I don't know. That's a situation where even at 77, based on what you're having to do with those lineups, I don't know. At least whenever I like don't talk about people or look at them, I don't know, man. That seems like a very much dead on arrival play. Byron Blaney, you know who else? Who else was? I'm trying to figure out what the field is doing. So we have Kozlowski, place differential. Suarez, who also got saved at the end of the race, who got who was running pretty poorly. Uh, past that, I mean, past like 20% ownership, it doesn't really matter. Because at that, at that ownership, every guy is acting independent of each other. You're not really dealing with duplicated lineups. But I just didn't get the Gibbs. I didn't get the Kyle Busch, man. It's crazy. There's a lot of, a lot of outs to where those guys don't work and stuff. Anyway, let's kind of go through, and I'll just kind of sort by. If I've been going this way, you've been seeing all the other stuff with, like, the guys up front. So let's go to, like, the guys who started on the back of the field. Uh, we're not going to include the last guys at the bottom. But uh, we'll just go here and kind of scrute right so you can see where these guys were um, running position-wise on, on the lap and stuff. But, yeah, like, Elliot, holy shit, man. That was very that, – that's insane. 21st, stuck 21st. Same story with Kyle Busch. Literally could not do a damn thing. Could not do a freaking thing. And then just stayed out and gained track position. But like, same thing with Logano. When you look at what Logano did, just running. Could not do a freaking thing. Could not pass anybody. Track position is so important. And you can argue... Well, like Briscoe, like people were able to maintain track position, stayed up, stayed up top, despite the fact like Briscoe entered this race with a very much uh, outside of the top twelve car, you know. And so, like when you look at Logano's race here, very much the same. Ran long, gained track position, and then took the lead. It's just, uh, just crazy how how wild Texas was. And so, anyway, you know, very long winded. We're forty five minutes in. Um, mainly just talking about how you need to certainly in a race like this. I think there are data points that are worth looking at. I think you can learn a lot from this race as well. But if you're just centering on like one data point or like, oh, this guy got saved or this guy didn't or whatever, like trying to understand the story of why things happened the way they did is very important. Um, 
and uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe you guys like this. Maybe you didn't. Uh, either way, that is a that is a Texas review, and it's stuff like this that I do for every single race, man. Uh, which is why I'm I'm kind of doing less like I guess preview videos or like they're shorter, just because like you don't want to sit here and just watch me go through this stuff for for an hour for each race. Actually, it's usually like an hour and fifteen process for like each race, because then it's like cross. I like if I find anything weird, I cross reference the race of what's going on in the actual race and see what's going on. It's you guys don't want to deal with that stuff. So anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, I'll see you guys in live shows this weekend for uh, Talladega. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys for Dover as well. So yeah, see you guys then.